welcome collectively um, uh, Dr. Glenn and Phyllis Hill, who have four children and ten grandchildren. Yeah, any more than about four grandchildren, I wonder how you even have any money. I just don't know how that's even possible anymore. But they have ten grandchildren. It all began for them at a summer camp in the Carolina mountains when they were 15 and 16 years of age when they met back in 1978. Then they got, then got married four years later. So you do the math, 20 years old. They were ill-prepared for marriage, and their first five years were horrific, uh, with continuous disconnection and pain. Their passion for helping relationships didn't begin with a business plan or a mission statement, but simply a desire to understand and help. So for many years of questions and research and experience and education, they finally figured out what causes connection and disconnection, and uh, are here today to share that with us. They've been married 40 years. So they got a few decades of research, human connection and experience. They form curriculum. Uh, go to their website, uh, connectioncodes.co, and you can get all kinds of great stuff. Uh, Dr. Glenn is a marriage and family therapist as well as a clinical sexologist. So many people, many people have a lack of intimacy. They cycle through miscommunication, unresolved conflict, but imagine getting and staying on the same page with your marriage partner, with your friends, experiencing security and trust in your relationships, feeling positive, encouraged all the time. So it's just going to be a great day as we meet our new friends today. Would you please stand to your feet, put your hands together, and welcome Dr. Glenn and Phyllis Hill to our Fivefold International Ministries Conference morning. Welcome in the name of the Lord. So uh, we are so thrilled to be here this morning and so honored um, and just, wow, what a great morning already so far. Love being here with you for worship. And yes, as it's been said, we're 40 years in. Mm. We met at a Bible camp mm. when we were teenagers. So Lots of stories for sure, and yes, 10 grandchildren, and they all live nearby, so they're at our house all the time, which is really very special yeah. and a lot of fun. Yeah. We're going to go fast, so if you brought some duct tape, I encourage you to wrap it around your head because we're going to blow your mind. <laughs> Just so you know, the connection codes are not presented from a faith-based perspective. We're faith-based. We have a deep abiding relationship with God. We don't present this from a book, chapter, and verse. This is just based on the human condition, which I personally believe God designed and created. So all of this is reflective of God's genius, but we don't actually quote book, chapters, and verse. I can do that for you uh, at another time if you like, but just for time's sake, we're going to fly through some of this stuff. Hopefully you have your handouts. I encourage you to take notes. Uh, so that you can keep up and go back and uh, review some of this. This is what we call the Connection Codes Foundations. And we begin by stating that humans are the least likely species on the planet to survive independently. Here's some pictures of some uh, one-year-olds. Who are you picking in a race? Who are you picking in a fight? Who are you picking to survive? The human doesn't stand a chance. But we are the most likely not just to survive, but to thrive interdependently. Now, there's a problem with that. Most of us don't do well interdependently. Mm. Most of us struggle having deep relationships. So wow. what do we do? So welcome to the Connection Codes. Mm. We want to go through with you what are the connection codes. Well, as uh, Eric mentioned, just a little bit of our background, the connection codes grew out of our pain. Again, mm -hmm. we did not invent the connection codes. We did not create the connection codes. We swept them into a pile and put a label on them, and we developed some tools to help facilitate them. But this is the human condition. Therefore, I know it's true of you and you and you and you and you. It's true of all of us. This is just, I happen to know, I could meet any of you, and I'm such a brilliant scientist, but I would already know that you breathe oxygen. 
That's how educated I am. I already know that about you. Well, no, every human breathes oxygen. That's the human condition. Well, these things we're talking about are the human condi condition. So the connection codes are the language of deep relationship. We want to help you get back to your original language. Again, we're born this way. We're born for deep connection. There are also a set of tools that we develop to help you facilitate that to make that happen. So we want to talk about the number one fundamental, foundational, most pressing human need, which is not food, water, or oxygen. You can go without food for weeks. You can go without water for days. You can go without oxygen for minutes uh, if you chose to. And you would be fine. There wouldn't be any harm from that. The number one fundamental, foundational, most pressing human need is what we call identity. Number one fundamental, foundational, most pressing human need. What do we mean by identity? We mean getting answers to questions like, do I exist? Do I exist to you? Do I matter? Do I matter to you? Do I have value and significance? Do I have value and significance to you? And do, am I good enough? Understand when we're talking about the identity here, we're not talking about your relationship with God. That is absolute. That is steadfast. That is unshakable. Uh, God's not going to love you any more tomorrow than he does today, any more than he did yesterday. God just adores you. That identity is uh, absolutely solid and unmovable. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what you experience with other human beings. Uh, as we mentioned, I have 10 grand, we have 10 grandchildren. Uh, we have two nine-year-old, um, we call them sister cousins, they're best friends, uh, and if Addie comes running in and says, Papa Haven's mad at me, she doesn't want to play with me, she doesn't want to be my friend, and I say to her, oh, no, no, that's okay, I love you, Addie, Addie would go, well, Papa, I know that, but Haven's mad at me, she doesn't want to play with me, she doesn't want to be my friend, I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't matter, because I love you, and Addie would go, Papa, that doesn't make any sense. I know you love me. This has nothing to do with your love for me. This has to do with how I'm doing with Haven. I'm like, no, you don't need to worry about that because I love you. And Addie would just give up and go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So we struggle with our identity with each other. Again, I'm not talking about your relationship with God. I'm talking about what we experience with each other. And most of us don't do real well with this. And we gain or lose identity with each other. And we don't even realize it. We don't even recognize it. So we would, the first challenge is for you to start recognizing identity when you gain it and when you lose it. Uh, whenever you're, uh, so we want you to become more and more aware of this. And Phyllis and I actually talk about this. There are two weird things about the connection codes. The identity piece is the first one because nobody talks this way. Nobody says, oh, I received identity whenever you stopped at Starbucks and got me a coffee. I, I just felt valued. I felt special. You didn't have to give me a coffee. You just did because you adore me. Or conversely, I say, I lost identity because you didn't give me a coffee from Starbucks. I'm not blaming Phyllis. I'm not saying it's her fault. I just lost some identity. She got some coffee for herself. She didn't get coffee for me. And I felt a little bit less valued, a little bit less special with her. That doesn't mean I have to go jump off a bridge. It doesn't mean we're going to end our relationship. It just means in that moment, I lost some identity. And I'm able to actually tell her that. This is a huge point in our families, in our marriage, but also as a church community. Mm. If people are walking in here and they are not gaining identity and they don't feel like they exist, they matter, they have any value, they will not stay here for very long. And this is such a huge piece that I think sometimes we miss. We put a lot of effort into things that are important, but if it doesn't create identity for those people that are sitting right here, eventually you just don't stay. And, and you think about that even as far as like we, we, we do, we want to worship well, we want to worship together, we want to pray together, we want to have activities together. But if people are sitting out there and they leave and no one has spoken to them, they will lose identity. And eventually that peace alone will cause them to not come back. Yeah, and you can say to them all day long, it's okay, God loves you. And they'll say, yeah, but I don't feel seen. Mm. I don't feel heard. And you go, no, 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 it doesn't matter because God loves you. Well, God does love them. I'm not questioning that at all, but that doesn't matter. They walked in here. They did not feel seen. They did not feel heard. They did not feel valued. They did not feel that they mattered, and they will leave having lost identity. And people can only do that for a certain period of time mm -hmm. before it becomes desperate. Uh, Aaron, can you put up the video, the still face video? 
We want to talk about uh, how this works for humans and where it starts. Uh, Dr. Ed Tronick in the 1970s did a series of experiments he called the still face experiments. These have been replicated endlessly. Research with humans is very complicated because humans are very complicated. Chemists do an experiment once and they go, we got it. Two particles of hydrogen, one particle of oxygen, you got water. You know how often you get water when you do that? Every stinking time. You know how difficult it is to work with humans? We literally replicate research hundreds and thousands of times, and we still can't figure out you people because you're that complex. You're that difficult. Sorry. <laughs> but it's true. Every one of us is unique. Every particle of hydrogen is the same as all the rest of them, so it's easy to work with. Humans are not this. So this research has been replicated, we know, hundreds of times and perhaps thousands. We don't know for sure. So we're going to watch this video. It's pretty brief, and then we'll talk about it. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a big That doesn't make any sense. When the mom's sitting there at the beginning with the baby, she's not providing anything for the baby. She's not giving the baby food, water, candy, toys, anything. Then when the mom goes still face, she's not taking anything away from the baby. So she's just sitting there. What difference does it make? The baby is losing identity. The baby is losing the sense that I matter, that I have value, that I'm special, that I have significance to this human no, 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 it doesn't matter because this is her biological mother. This is the woman who brought her into the world. This is the woman that kept her alive for a year. Doesn't matter in that moment. And did you notice how quickly the baby noticed? It was one second. He was like, oh, my gosh, what just happened? My universe just shifted. Chill out, baby. It's no big deal. Nothing's changed. Yes, it has, too. I, the baby, am losing identity. And I get overwhelmed very, very quickly. Dr. Tronick originally did this research with a mom and a baby, then began doing variations on the theme, uh, began using a dad, then just an adult caregiver. In one of the variations on the theme, he had the adult get up and leave the room. So the baby would just be alone. And the baby would be fine for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four, five, six minutes. The baby's just hanging out. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The adult's gone. The baby doesn't know where the adult went. The baby should be panicked. No, the baby's fine. So what we learn from this is that relational absence is worse than geographical absence. If we're actually separated from each other, we're in a different room from each other, we're okay. If we're together geographically, so we're right beside each other, and I get a still face from Phyllis, I get lost very, very quickly. And I don't know what to do. Now, I'm not supposed to cry and scream and screech and squeal and throw things. I don't very often, but I have been guilty, <laughs> and most of us do. Uh, but we, it's the exact same experience. So what we learn from this is so crucial is that the uh, still face experiment is the still face experience is not a baby experience. It's a human 
experience. And it's just as true for us older babies. Just because you had a bunch more birthdays, there's no birthday where we're like, you're 10 now. Now a still face won't bother you anymore. Congratulations, you're 10. Nope. Doesn't matter if you're 10, 15, 20, 30, 35, 40, 50, I'm 60. When I experience a still face with someone, that would be true if I met some of you today. If I walked up to you and I said, hi, my name's Glenn, and you just looked at me blankly. You're not punching me. You're not stabbing me. But you don't respond to me. I very quickly get lost. Now, Again, hopefully I wouldn't cry, scream, screech, squeal, and throw things. But in that moment, I very quickly get overwhelmed. And it doesn't take 45 minutes. It takes about 15, 20 seconds where I'm just like, oh, I don't, I don't know what's happening with this person, but I don't want to be around them. They're just, again, I'm not allowed to go key your car. I'm not allowed to go burn your house down. But in that moment, it becomes very, very painful for me. You know, when you think about in our relationships, whether you are married or not married, whether you have children or don't have children, in a work environment, in a church family, it, it all plays out when you start thinking about, wow, that is so true. You, you are drawn to people who give you that identity, who are kind to you, who say hello. And, you know, we hear this even in a work environment, that if this identity piece is missing, it becomes a toxic work environment. Because there is this missing piece. And, and I think in families how it often plays out where we really kind of get lazy. We get so in tune with our own devices that we don't even really hear each other. And maybe it's like we hear each other, but we don't respond to each other. And if you have children, you really start to notice this, is that when your children don't feel that you're listening, they will get louder and louder until they have your undivided attention. And it's that need that they have with the identity. They need to know they matter in your family. And I mean, even in this picture, I think, you know, modern devices can be great. I don't know how we would have even gotten here without this GPS that's now in our phone. And yet that great tool can also become what divides us. It can become the thing that I am so into that I'm really not listening. I'm not paying attention to what Glenn is saying to me. And it's so quickly this happens where the lack of acknowledgement of what he has just said to me becomes that visceral experience mm. of, wow, I no longer exist. I don't any longer matter in her world. And that is extremely painful. Yeah. We did a variation on some of Dr. Tronic's uh, research where we set a baby down and we had four people stand in front of the baby. Total strangers. The baby didn't know them. They didn't know the baby. We mixed it up a lot. Different colored clothing, tall, short, uh, male, female, whatever. And three of the individuals were instructed to give a still face. One of them was instructed to engage with the baby. Now, all four of them are looking at the baby, but only one of them is actually engaging with the baby. In 100% of the experiments, the baby begins honing in on the non-still face person. The baby doesn't know who that is. What do you care? Eh, that's just the human condition. And the baby, the three still face people begin disappearing from the baby's universe. The baby very quickly gets the message that I don't matter to them. Well, you know what? You don't matter to me. Now, again, as an adult, I'm not allowed to go key your car, but I pretty quickly pick up on it. And again, hopefully I'm able to be polite to you anyway, but I'm going to walk away going, note to self, <laughs> that's not going to be my friend. I'm not mad at you. I'm not condemning you. I'm not judging you. I just realized that whew, when I'm with that person, what I experience is they do not care about me. You know, I've sat with people before where they'll talk for 40 minutes about their life story, which is fine, and I'm more than delighted to hear it. They never ask me one question about me. And I'll walk away going, Ugh, I don't think I really matter to that person. I don't think I really exist to that person. I don't think I really have any value or significance to that person. Again, not allowed to be mean to them, not allowed to go key their car. But in that moment, my whole body, my psyche goes, eh, note to self, that's probably not going to be a close friend. That's not going to be someone you're able to connect uh, with. So uh, another weird thing, we want you to start recognizing the still face, to actually be able to say that to the other person, certainly to be able to recognize it. And again, I'm not blaming Phyllis. Phyllis is an incredibly productive person, incredibly busy, uh, which is awesome. We are where we are today because of her, mostly. Uh, I'm cute and funny, but uh, I really don't have that much talent. <laughs> so it's mostly her that coordinates everything. Uh, so she's just busy. 
And again, she may be on her phone actually coordinating the Airbnb where we're going to stay in Springfield, Illinois. She's not doing something evil, but if I walk in the room and I say, hey, babe, and she doesn't respond, I experience a still face. I can't emphasize this enough. Phyllis is not wrong. The still face is about what happened with me. I'm not judging her, condemning her, criticizing her, whatever, labeling her. I experience a still face, and I'm able to say that to her like, oh, babe, that felt like a still face. And she's literally able to engage with me uh, in that moment. So we want you to be able to do that. That leads us to a big puzzle piece. This is so crucial that you need to learn how to spell it. Now, there's several dozen versions of it, uh, so we're going to talk about just the different ways that we convey this, but this is what we call the ooh. Ooh is always the correct response. Ooh is always the right answer. What do we mean by that? Somebody shares something with you. You can be completely silent with them. Now, you may be totally tuned into them. I'm not saying you're ignoring them. You may literally be staring them in the eye and totally conveying or or being present, but you're not conveying presence. So we want to get you good at literally just being able to go, oh, hmm, yeah, okay. That was four different versions of the ooh right there. Somebody says, uh, I'm from Idaho. You go, oh, Idaho. No, it doesn't matter what they said. They could have said Australia, South Africa, Nigeria, Germany. It doesn't matter what they said. But literally, you're just being audible. Our research is really emphatic in this. When you're audible with someone, it tickles their brain differently than if you're silent. Again, I'm not judging you about your silence. You may have really been tuning in, but their brain activates differently. When you're silent, their brain gets hit in the fear region of the brain because they don't know what you're, what's happening with you. Where, and so Phyllis and I uh, ooh each other all the time. We encourage people to go to Amazon.com, get an extra large box of oohs because uh, you're going to need a lot of them. Uh, I had someone come back to my office one week, and he said, Dr. Hill, they don't carry those on Amazon. So it's a joke. It's, I'm being facetious. They don't really have them. Uh, so you can make it. And I told the guy in my office, I said, you know what? We'll just make our own. And we literally did. We wrote ooh on a bunch of pieces of paper. Uh, so, but anyway, the point is you're going to use a ton of these. And if you watch Phyllis and me interact, I'm ooing her all day long. I have no idea how many oohs I use, probably half a box a day, uh, because I'm always wanting her to know that I'm present with her, that I'm hearing her. I think, as I mentioned earlier, just like with uh, all relationships, you know, if you're at work and you have a boss and you're trying to explain something and he, and he or she is just staring at you, it becomes awkward. You feel like you need to just hurry up and finish your sentence. But if they are engaging like, oh, oh, yeah, wow, okay, I hear that, then you feel like you're being just heard, which is such a huge thing. It's such a valuable piece in our relationship. And here as a church family, you know, when you meet someone new, for them to know, oh, wow. And whatever they're telling you, it's not that you're agreeing with them. It's that you are acknowledging that you're hearing them. And it's like those type of relationships you want to keep going with. Where when you meet someone and you don't get anything, they may be smiling at you, but you're still not sure what beyond that smile is happening. And so you want to walk away. You want to get away from that. And of course, as we've mentioned, you see it in children so much. They want to not just see your eyes. They want to actually hear something come out of your mm-hmm. mouth. And it's, it's just, again, ooh is just a title. It's just an, a verbal acknowledgement that you are hearing what is being said to you. Yeah. Okay, your sheet doesn't match up perfectly with this, so close your eyes and pretend like you're not seeing this because we're going to go to, we're merging these together. So understand, uh, with our experimenting with the still face experiment, our takeaway is that we're coded to move toward identity. Again, that's true for every human on the planet. Therefore, I know it's true of you. You just move towards identity. When you receive identity, you walk in a room and somebody says, hey, Eric, uh, come sit with us. Eric's drawn to that. Not because something's wrong with him, because something's right with him, because he's human. He was recognized. He received identity. He's like, oh, cool. My friends are over there. They're sitting. Now, he's not saying there's anything wrong. He's not judging all the other people in the room. But whenever they call his name and say, hey, would you come sit with us? He receives identity. He's like, oh, I matter to them. I have value. Cool. Mm -hmm. That just feels good. We're coded that way. Again, we're just hardwired. I believe in God. I believe God designed it. Even if it's evolutionary, it's still true. This is just a human condition. This is how we humans uh, operate. That's true uh, for all of us. So understand that the need for identity is not good, bad, right, or wrong, positive, or negative. And you're not going to outgrow it. The need for identity just is. That's how humans operate. So, but understand that. You don't outgrow your need for identity. I'm 60. My need for identity is just as strong today as it was when I was 6 or 12 months old. It's the same. It doesn't change. It's a lifetime experience. This is true for all of us. Again, we're not talking about identity with God. We're talking about what happens in our personal relationships, what happens uh, between us. 
Understand too, when someone loses identity, it can become as desperate as losing oxygen. What would this guy be willing to do to get out of that uh, water? Anything. And if we did not understand his situation and we were watching him, we would think he was crazy. We'd be like, that's a violent person. And if you were standing in the way from him getting out of that water to oxygen, what would he do to you? I don't know. Might not be pretty. He'd go berserk. And again, if I was watching and I didn't understand the situation, I'd be like, what is wrong with that guy? My word, he's a violent lunatic. Well, he's trying to get to oxygen. He's overwhelmed. He's desperate. The exact same things happen with identity. When someone loses identity, what are they, how are they going to behave in the next 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes? I don't know. But it probably won't be pretty. So I want you to, my, the way I live life now, anytime I see somebody's behavior that I don't understand, I automatically go, I bet it's an identity issue. No, it's not always, but usually it is. Something happened where that person lost identity, and I want to be able to be present with them to ooh them and just hear what's happening with them. Now, connection coders, people in our circle, our teammates, I'll actually, I'll actually ask them, I'll go, did, did, what just happened there? Did seemed to me like maybe that's an identity issue. I could be wrong. Again, we just ask. We don't uh, tell. Uh, we just ask, is that what happened there? Catch me up because I want to know what happened for you. Okay, next puzzle piece. In the 1930s, there was a natural disaster in Central America. Uh, because of that, a lot of people died. Because of that, there were a lot of orphans. Uh, a psychologist from the United States went down to take notes just to document what was happening in this experience. And he said, the babies are really out of control. Now, I'm not judging the caseworkers. They were overwhelmed. They were just trying to keep up. I get that. So I'm not criticizing them. Uh, and they've all passed away 100 years ago. So, uh, But I'm not saying that they were doing something wrong. But the babies are overwhelmed. So the psychologist is taking notes about this. As he continued his notes, as time passed, he said, it's getting worse. It's just chaos. It's crazy. Throughout the night, I mean, there's never a moment's silence the babies are just hysterical. As time passed, he took more notes and he said, huh, the babies seem to be adjusting to their new environment. They're not as upset as they were days ago. They're, they're calming down. Sometimes there's just silence. There's, it's not chaos like it was before. The babies seem to be adjusting to their environment. As time passed more, he moved his chair closer so he could observe a little bit more closely. And he wrote in his journal, the babies did not adjust they gave up. He said, these babies don't exist anymore. Now, they're here geographically, but I look in their eyes, they don't even see me. We must feel heard. Not be heard, there's a difference. We must feel heard, if not, we get louder and louder, and then we'll eventually give up. There's a lot of relationships that you know, and probably some in this room, where one party or both have given up. They got louder and louder. Again, I'm not a, a, approving of the way people get loud sometimes. Sometimes it's awful. Sometimes it's wrong. But they got louder and louder, and eventually they just gave up. Now, different people experience it in different ways. People get louder in different ways. People give up at different rates. I sit with couples that uh, they've been together for 27 years, uh, and it took 27 years, and finally she just gave up. She said, I give up. I'm never going to be able to connect with him. I'm never going to be able to reach him. I'm like, whoa, took you a quarter of a century. That's impressive that you had, I'm not even agreeing with it. I'm just going, that's impressive that you hung in there for 27 years. Uh, that's amazing. But at some point, you're going to give up. So we want to make sure that people are feeling hurt. Again, I see people all the time, they go, I heard you. I heard you the first seven times you said it. That's not the question. That's not the issue. The issue is not, did they, were their ears working? The question is, did that person feel heard? That's a great question to ask people, to ask your spouse, ask your kids, ask your neighbor, ask your uh, friend, your cousin. Do you feel heard by me? And whenever they say no, what's your response going to be? Just a new, oh, wow, hmm, okay, help me get that. And again, I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying that you're evil or wrong because they don't feel heard, but often people don't feel heard, and so they're getting louder and louder. And we're watching their behavior going, well, this is just ridiculous. This is just a bad person. Their behavior is so bad, so negative. Well, I get that. I'm not agreeing with. I'm not condoning. I'm not approving of their behavior. But find out what's happening before that that's leading to 
uh, that behavior. Okay, next puzzle piece. If you disregard a person's experience, if you disregard a person's emotion, you disregard the person. This little girl comes in. Uh, I don't know how old she is. Let's say she's, what do you think, six? Mm -hmm. Something like that. She comes running in. She goes, Daddy, look, I drew you this painting. And the dad picks it up and looks at it, and he goes, I can't even tell what this is. And he wads it up and throws it in the trash. And then he turns back to the little girl. And he says, but I care about you. I love you. Do you think she'd believe him? Why not? He said, I love you. He disregarded her experience. It's just a piece of paper. What do you get? Well, that's just the human condition. If you disregard my experience, if you disregard my emotion, you've disregarded me. I get lost very quickly. Now, again, many of us would go, well, I would never do that to a six-year-old. That's just awful. We do that all the time. Not from a bad heart. I'm not judging your motive. I'm not judging your intention. We do that all the time with people. They come in to us and they go, whew, I've had a really tough week. I've had a stressful week. And we're like, what? No, you're, God's in control. You're good. You're okay. And then I walk away. And I'm like, do you see what I just did? I just encouraged her. I just blessed her. Maybe I gave her a scripture. Maybe I gave her a prayer. And she's good now. No, she's not. She's worse off than when I first walked in. So this is a huge one. Maybe we should repeat it. Because when you think, I know I was raised, I was known as the encourager. Mm. And, and I, I really believed in that. Like I believed that all you needed was a word of encouragement, a prayer, a, a scripture. And what I missed was that I wasn't really listening. I wasn't regarding the person's experience. I was wanting to fix the person. I was wanting to help the person. From a good intention, mm. from a good heart. I wanted to solve it for you. And we do this all the time. And we do it out of a good heart. We do it because we believe that's what we are called to do. We don't really slow ourselves down to go, whoa. Because I think we reacted. I would say 100% of this room reacted to, oh my goodness, you never wad up a paper. Now, you may have limited wall space and limited refrigerator space. Totally get that. I think parents really struggle. Grandparents really struggle. Like, what do we do with all this art? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the moment, in that moment, to wad it up in front of their face mm. and to throw it away. Wow. That is the pain. That is in the moment. You're, not, you're missing it. You're not regarding what they're going through. Sometimes we just need to sit in each other's pain. Mm. You're feeling pain. Let me just sit with you in that. And ooh you. And just give you that, ooh oh. you, that audible response of, oh, wow. And even asking the next, next question. Mm. We don't even do it well at times when, when we're grieving. When someone is grieving, we want to quickly note. We want to remind them, oh, but your grandmother's in heaven. Let's rejoice. Mm, that's disregarding their grief. And again, that is, from a good heart, good intention, good motivation. We're not judging your heart in it. It just doesn't work. Yeah. We just miss each other in those moments. Hmm. And we miss each other probably every day in our house in those hmm. moments with your teenagers where you're just like, ah, you think your life is rough? Wait till you're an adult hmm. and you have to pay the bills and you have to have a full-time job and you have to take care of your car. Well, that may all be true facts, but you've just regarded your teenager's emotion. You just re disregarded their bad day. You just re disregarded whatever they're going through by telling them truth yeah. instead of just hearing them and going, oh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And we see parents do this a lot. You think that 14-year-old boy, you're not even going to know his name 10 years from now. What do you care about him? Well, she lost identity. It was a painful experience for her. Oh, pfft, it doesn't matter. Forget him. No, it didn't work that way. Sorry. And all that's going to happen is these kids eventually will get the message that they don't matter to you. They'll lose so much identity with you that once they pick a number, 15, 16, they just won't turn to you anymore. And then we're startled by that and we're like, how come my kids don't turn to me? Because you've been telling them they don't matter for 10 years. Not from a bad heart. I'm not judging your intention in it. 
But actually what they received from you was that their experience didn't matter. You disregarded their experience, therefore you disregarded the person. If you regard a person, this is the beauty of it, if you switch it in reverse, if you regard a person's experience, if you regard a person's emotion, you regard the person. Again, you can say you're from Idaho. I'd be like, oh, Idaho. That's one of the two states I've never been to, Idaho and Hawaii. Well, it doesn't matter what you said. You can say anything. But I'm going to ooh you. I'm going to regard you. So we got to speed up here real quick. So how do we do that? How do we make sure the person feels regarded? We follow the energy. We follow their energy instead of resisting their energy. When the little girl, uh, the 13-year-old girl says, oh, this boy's school was mean to me and I liked him, uh, we just go, oh, wow. Hmm. And then... This is what we're going to add to the ooh. We never ask why in relationships. Why do you feel that way? Uh, our research showed that people never, I never say never because I'm a scientist, never connect whenever they're challenged with why. Why sounds like a challenge. Why feels like an attack. Why do you act like that? Why do you do that? Why do you feel that way? So instead of asking why, we ask people what happens. Why is an uh, indicts? What happens invites? Why is an accusation? What happens is an invitation. We want to be able to be present with people. So we add to the ooh, the what happens. We go, oh, so what happens for you there? Help me get that. Again, it may not seem that way to me, but that's what's happening for that person in a moment. There's three tenses of what happens, what happens, what's happening, and what happened. Uh, so you're able to say to somebody, so, oh, yeah, so, so what, what happens for you there? What happened for you yesterday morning when that experience happened uh, for you? So we add to the ooh, all the versions of the ooh. Uh, we add uh, what happens, and then we're going to get a little box of on um, Amazon.com, a little box of I missed it. Be able to say to people, I think I'm missing something here. Hey, could you catch me up? I'm a little slow sometime. Help me get what happened for you that that was such a tough experience for you. And so literally all day long, Phyllis and I, we call these the three phrases. We're using the three phrases. We literally go, oh, wow. Hmm. So what happens for you there? Help me get it. What am I missing? There, because this girl matters to me, and I do this with all my relationships. This is number one. Uh, this girl matters to me. I want to find out what's happening for her. Will it make any sense to me? It might not. She experiences things differently than I do, and I experience things differently than she does. There's lots of things that happen with me that this girl's going, oh, wow, huh. So help me get that. What happens for you there? Because it doesn't make any sense to her. But again, she's present with me. She's regarding. And I hope you see how the puzzle pieces start fitting together. Uh, she's regarding my experience. I'm receiving identity like, oh, I matter to her her. She's, find, she's following my energy. She's finding out what's happening for me. Well, cool. I'm special. I matter to her. Uh, but there are other resources that we have. We have a book. Uh, we have a workbook. We have master classes that you can get from our uh, website. We have a podcast that we do. So uh, if and of course, even if you come back tonight, we would encourage you to get involved with all this because this is really important human information and yeah. all of you are involved in humans yeah. and so this is the stuff you really got to know yeah okay we're going to talk about emotion for a few minutes some of this will be very countercultural for some of you because we have been lied to and we've lied to each other for centuries this is not a new development this has been done for a long long time i remember hearing this as a child just being told these things well here's some truths that we know from research this is just the human condition uh, you may not like it, but it's just the human condition. So we're going to fly through these uh, to see if we can get through them. Emotion is a fundamental human right. How do we know that? Because every human on the planet experiences emotion in five neural regions. You cannot get away from it. You'll talk to people to go, I'm not emotional. That's not true. That's the equivalent of them saying, I'm not oxygen-oriented. I don't do oxygen. I used to when I was younger, but I gave up on it. You go, that's not true. And they may literally believe that it's not true. They use oxygen and they experience emotion. Uh, the five regions are anger, fear, pain, pleasure, and disgust. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. Emotion serves a purpose. So if you got this stuff, what are you going to do with it? Well, you don't have to do anything with it. It serves a purpose. Uh, it's to guide and protect you. It's actually trying to help you. Now, I didn't believe that for years because emotions is what wrecked me, and I didn't understand. That was because I didn't understand emotion. I didn't know what was happening uh, with me. But emotion is actually attempting to guide and protect you. Again, we're faith-based. We believe God designed this. Even if it's evolutionary, it's still true. This is how humans operate. This is how humans function. I don't have to quote book, chapter, and verse to you to convince you of gravity. You know, you're on the edge of a cliff. I'm like, dude, don't take another step. And you're like, it's okay, I'm an atheist. I'm like, well, no. And you're like, no, I don't believe in God. And that's the end of you. Uh, and you're like, 
the, the gravity is still real. And if you don't believe in God, it's still real. And I'm going to try to convince you uh, of that. Emotion happens to you. This is really big for a lot of people. You need to understand that you are not responsible for your emotions. Nobody is, and nobody can be. You cannot control your emotions. Emotions are brain chemistry. This is what's happening in your brain. Now, you are responsible for your next action. You're not allowed to stab me in the chest because you felt mad at me. Well, you're not allowed to do that next action. But the fact that you felt mad at me, you felt anger, that's just what's happening in your brain. Uh, You felt hurt by me. Uh, Well, you didn't decide to feel hurt. What moron would choose to feel hurt? They get up in the morning like, what's my plan for the day? What am I going to experience emotionally? (gasps) I'm going to feel a lot of hurt, and I'm going to really feel a lot of fear, and I'm going to feel some shame. Nobody does that. Nobody on the whole planet does that. That's not the human condition. We don't choose to experience those things. If one of those light bulbs exploded right now, you'd feel fear. You didn't decide to feel fear. That's just what happened to you. It's literally brain chemistry. Now, different ones of us would react different ways, but we all go, whoa, just a light bulb exploded, and it threw glass uh, everywhere. You're not trying to feel fear. And if I said to you, you should not feel fear, stop it. That doesn't change anything. And if I say, and shut up about it, I don't want to hear about your fear, which is what we do all the time. We don't say those words, but that's what we do to people. Don't feel fear. Well, I wasn't trying to feel fear. I just felt fear. That's a big side note we won't get into, but just so you know, and I'd encourage you to research this in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek, Scripture never says don't feel fear. That's not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture says don't react out of that fear. Don't panic. Don't do something detrimental from the fear. But the Scripture never says, and it's transliterated into English that way. I get that many times. Uh, But that's not what the actual language uh, says. Next point. Uh, The limbic system engages before the cortexes. Well, who cares? What does that mean? Well, the limbic system is what houses the emotions. It's the central command center of emotion. Now, emotion occurs throughout the body, but the the command center is in the limbic system. Well, what difference does that make? Because the limbic system engages before the cortexes. Well, who cares about the cortexes? The cortexes are where thought, reason, and logic occur. When your limbic system is flooded, you're a dumber version of yourself. Not because you're dumb but because you're human. We did a lot of research on this where we would uh, ask people questions and then we have a door slam behind them and they don't know what six times three is. We did this on a college campus. Literally, people would go, six times three is the door slams, uh, uh, 21. No, uh, uh, six times three is 15. Oh, hold on. They don't know what six, I'm like, what's what's the matter with you? You're in college. What are you, an idiot or something? Are your parents rich? How'd you get in here? You don't even know what six times three is. No, no, no. In that moment, they can't think clearly. You've heard people say, I was so upset I couldn't think straight. That is scientifically accurate. That's exactly what's happening. And in that moment, they can't think straight, and they're a dumber version of themselves. And that's true for all of us. There are no exceptions to this. We act different ways. I get it. Every human's unique. But that's true for all of us. We feel before we think. So what are we going to do about that? Well, it's important to understand that when these things happen... Uh, We're, again, as I said, we're dumber versions, we're lesser versions of ourselves because intense emotions shut down cognition and you can't think straight. Not because you're an idiot, not because you're a moron, it's because you're a human. That's true for you, that's true for me, that's true for everyone on the planet. It's not because you're bad or wrong or immature or unspiritual or whatever. It's because you're human, that's what happens. And unprocessed emotion hinders cognition. Again, it may not be an intense emotion that completely shuts down cognition, but it's an unprocessed emotion that hinders cognition and you can't think as well. You're not as productive. We're amazed at the research. of uh, Our research tells us that about people are mostly operating on about a 35% efficiency rate in life. I read an article the other day that said we should tell people to show up for work at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That's all they're getting done anyway from 1 to 5. So you just tell them to stay home and get connected with their people, process through what's happening with them, and they'll get to work at 1, and they will get more done from 1 to 5 than they've been getting done from 8 to 5. And I think that's probably true. This will blow your mind. Uh, Recent research, just the last couple of years, says that humans can't experience an emotion for more than 19 seconds if it's not reactivated. What do we mean by reactivated? Well, that can be many things that makes that happen. One of those things is we resist people's energy. They come in and they say, whew, stressful week, tough, tough week. Man, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm really struggling. We're like, what? No, God loves you. You're good. And we walk away. We reactivated that emotion. Now it's going to take them an hour and a half or a week and a half. 
to process it. But Phyllis comes to me and she goes, babe, I really felt hurt earlier by what you said. You know what I'm going to respond to her? I'm going to go, what? No, don't feel hurt. That's stupid. Don't, don't, you don't need to feel hurt. I didn't mean anything bad by that. That's what I used to do. I don't do that now. I literally do the three phrases. I go, oh, well, wait, what, what happened? What did I miss? And she tells me, and I go, oh, shoot, I get that. I mean, I'm not saying I meant to hurt her. I'm not indicting myself. I just get it that she felt pain. She felt hurt. She wasn't trying to feel hurt. She just felt hurt. And I'm present with her. And literally, we're 19 seconds into this interaction, and the emotion has been processed. Blows my mind. This will light you up. So, for the sake of time, we are flying through these. Yes. And we want to acknowledge that this is a lot of information. We could spend an hour on each of the things that Glenn has just mentioned. And if right now your mind is spinning and you have questions, we totally get that. And we want to make space for that. We just don't have that time this morning. Hmm. Yeah, so two more points real quickly, and that means you have to come back tonight. The brain does not distinguish physical and emotional pain. We learned this about 15 years ago. Uh, they both process uh, through the anterior cingulate. That's true for every human on the planet. Therefore, I know it's true for you. When I feel hurt by Phyllis, my arm starts bleeding. No, not actually. My body doesn't know that, but my brain knows that. And whenever I feel hurt by her, my arm starts bleeding. It kind of be cool if that was true. Because Phyllis would look over and she'd go, oh my goodness, babe, what, what happened? You're, like your arm is bleeding. You got blood gushing out of your arm. I'm like, oh, I just kind of felt hurt by what you said. That would really tune her into me, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be amazing? But again, understand, the brain doesn't know the difference. The brain is experiencing the exact same thing as though she had cut my arm with a knife. And again, I'm not blaming her. I'm not criticizing her. That's just what's happening in my brain. And then the last point is that humans connect through emotion, not logistics. And most of us have been raised to believe that we connect through logistics. If you're a chess player, you join a chess club, you're going to have best friends. Not necessarily. You might be best friends with a skydiver. What? Chess players and skydivers have nothing in common, logistically. No, but they're both humans. And they can connect through identity. They can connect through emotions. And that's just as true in our churches. We say, that guy loves Jesus, and that guy loves Jesus, therefore they'll connect. Not necessarily. No, I love Jesus. But that does not necessarily mean we're going to be connected. I'd like for us to be, but we may not be. Because if I don't receive identity from you, uh, if I don't uh, receive identity with you, if I don't feel seen and heard, again, I hope you see how the puzzle starts working together. If you resist my energy, you slap me on the back and tell me to stop experiencing what I'm experiencing. Uh, no, we're not going to connect. <gasps> what about Jesus? Well, I'm not against him. I'm not mad at him. He, I get it. He loves Jesus. Well, I love Jesus too. That does not necessarily mean that we're going to connect. Wow. <laughs> so as I've already said that was a lot and again we we realize and at times it's like how do we present something to you that will ignite within your soul and a desire to learn more a desire to go whoa maybe in my marriage this is what I've been missing I think in a lot of our marriages we have court cases we come before the judge whoever that may be and we go here is what really happened and then your spouse goes no here is what really happened and you are duking it out to present to figure out who's right who's wrong and when you go whoa you mean we don't connect through the logistics of what really happened you mean we connect through the emotion of what really just happened it's like yeah so that could be where you're missing it in your marriage, in your relationship with your mom, in your relationship with your children. You may be all about the logistics, and you're totally missing each other because you've left out the emotion, and you're not connecting emotionally. And again, we love what it has done for our marriage. Uh, we, we love that we now have a way to really tune into each other. We are as different today as we were the day we met. And we, are, uh, we have different everything. And, and there's a lot of humor in our house because we are so different. Mm -hmm. But now we have a language that we both understand and we can connect so deeply. And we stayed so connected to our grown children and their spouses mm -hmm. and our grandchildren with these tools. Yeah, and let me mention real quickly, just because it's important, because I don't want this afternoon to be a free-for-all. There's a world of difference between processing emotion together and communicating through the emotion. Because I sit with couples all the time, they go, they're like, we're so emotional. We scream at each other. We cuss at each other every day. No, 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 no. There's a big difference between those. I want you to process through the emotion. Again, what that looks like is for me to be able to say to Phyllis, I felt hurt. 
by what you said. Versus I come in the room and I go, you're such a jerk. I don't know why in the world I ever married you. Look how emotional Glenn is. Well, yeah, but he's communicating through the emotion. He's not communicating the emotion. I want him to be able to communicate.